So tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Lee Newman. Uh, he has recently retired as Curator of Tropics at the Vancouver Aquarium. I believe he did that for, well, he, for as many years as I ever uh, was associated there, which is since 2001. Uh, he has been a fish keeper for over 50 years with a keen interest in cichlids. Uh, he's a popular speaker at international conventions and conferences and has written articles for magazines and journals. Now, in addition to that, Lee is an, an also an avid and technical scuba diver and underwater photographer. He's a certified cave diver and he has presented to us previously in 2016 on a trip to Bonaire. So tonight, his presentation and photos are highlighting his and our backyard in House Sound. So I am so pleased to have Lee Newman join us tonight. And Lee, it is over to you. When when Joan first asked me to uh, present on the marine biodiversity of House Sound, I thought, well, I'm certainly not the most qualified person to do that. So I had to put a qualifier in. So the qualifier, of course, is the first three words. These are going to be scuba diving observations on the biodiverse, marine biodiversity of House Sound. Uh, I'll state right at the very top here that it's not going to be an exhaustive list of everything you could ever see in House Sound. I think we'd be here until well into uh, the weekend um, if that were the case. So um, there, uh, the, the other thing that I'd like to do is uh, maybe add in a little ecology. Because when you talk about biodiversity, oftentimes uh, it, it can, it can and the circles that I travel in, and it ends up turning into a um, a list of species. So you end up with this species name, and it's great that that uh, that people learn the names, the proper names of the animals and stuff. But I think that's really the tip of the iceberg, or the part of, part of the iceberg that you can see. The big part that 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 takes a little bit more observation is to find out how these animals make their living, how they go about eating, so acquiring food, how they how they go about not being food or not being acquired as food, um, how they reproduce and, and, and things like that. So in this talk, I'm going to add in a little ecology because uh, if, if you sort of, if you're diving with your eyes open and paying attention to what's going on around you in, in the marine environment, it's amazing what you can see. So a quick word, uh, just a few slides about scuba diving. So this is this is my wife, Lisa. This is recreational diving gear. So it's a single tank on her back. And it's just the, you know, the regular uh, BC uh, buoyancy compensator device, a regulator, a light, you know, the, the usual things that you would take um, as a scuba diver. And we do a lot of that. Uh, we also have invested in uh, DPVs, which is a diver diver propulsion vehicle, which is um, kind of just the fancy name for a for a, a battery operated sort of torpedo that without the explosive part, of course, um, that tows you around. And uh, I hopefully you can see there. That's my our dive buddy Eric, who has uh, his scooter clipped up to a harness. The harness is part of your uh, part of the BCD arrangement and uh, the buoyancy compensator arrangement. And that pulls you around. So when his hand is resting on the handle, that's really all it's doing is resting on the handle and pulling the trigger when he wants to go somewhere. So you don't have to hang on for dear life. Um, it also gives your other hand free to do other things. Sorry, the one last the thing is, the thing is about scooters is they make the dive sites bigger like literally by kilometers. We can go a couple of, um, just as an example, um, Eric and I did a dive not that long ago. We went from Porto Cove up to Furry Creek and back, all on all underwater with the help of these scooters. So it makes the dive sites huge. So we can we can go to places that aren't really visited very often. The other, the other thing we engage in is technical diving. It's my friend uh, Blaine, and he... Uh, he has some things. I hopefully you can see my mouse. So on his back, he's got two scuba tanks joined by a manifold. In there, there's some helium. And we use helium uh, to breathe because it makes the gas density lighter the deeper we It makes it lighter as we go deeper into the water. 
So as we go, as we descend, the gas would normally get thicker and harder to breathe and your body would build up carbon dioxide. The helium is designed to be added as a diluent to dilute that density down so that it makes it easier to breathe and we don't accumulate CO2. So this, this bottle here is called a stage bottle. It would be filled with that helium mixture as well. This bottle here would be filled with um, some sort of oxygen mixture, either 50% or even 100%, one of those. And this bottle in here tucked behind his back is actually what he uses to inflate his dry suit because we can't use helium to do that because helium is such a great conductor of heat that if we filled our suits with helium, we'd, we'd get very cold. So that, that extends our range. So now our dive sites can go, our dive sites are much deeper and they're, you know, um, much, uh, much more broad in terms of, you know, going north or west or east or south, whatever the orientation of the dive site is, we can go a lot further um, down and, and horizontally than most recreational divers in this configuration. The camera I use is nothing fancy. It's a Canon 7D, just so you guys know. It's in an aquatic housing. Um, I use two strobes. Um, for the first couple of years, I only used one. Realized that you have better control over shadows and lighting with two, obviously. I put one arm on each side. I know it's a very popular configuration to put two arms on each side, but I felt like I was wrestling a nine-headed sea monster when I had um, two segments on each arm. So I just do the one. It makes it a lot easier to manage. And well, the pictures you guys can can judge for yourselves. And then on top is a focus light, just so in the inky depths of how sound, especially in summertime, uh, we can see I can see what I'm taking a picture of. So speaking of inky depths in the summertime, um, we also we dive in the summer, which is uh, usually in the first few months, starting in sort of late March. Uh, in, especially into April, and then usually it carries on all the way through to the end of June, usually. Uh, this is what the water looks like in the shallows. Eventually, uh, in, in the uh, in-house sound, in the, in the early part of, or late, late spring, early summer, it, it starts to stratify. So that layer that you're seeing us in here is very shallow, but that layer is restricted to the top 10 meters or or uh, thereabouts 30 feet. Um, and then once you get below that, it's actually quite a bit clearer, but it's quite a bit darker. We also dive uh, in the winter time. Uh, oddly enough, uh, you do get some funny looks when you're in the parking lot, you know, getting ready to get in the water and everyone else is bundled up in their parkas and hats and uh, mitts and everything. And they're, you know, they're asking you, you're going where? And turns out that winter in Vancouver, and especially in House Sound, it's one of the better times to, to, uh, to dive and to be able to see things because we don't get that much sunlight during the winter. I think the last few days have been an exception, quite enjoyable, I have to say. Um, but most of the time, we don't get a lot of uh, sunshine and the visibility clears up. The algae dies back and the water gets very clear. And that's always a, a good thing to have is good visibility while you're scuba diving. It makes it safer but, uh, and also much more enjoyable. And the bonus part of that is that parking is really easy in the winter. We dive during the daytime. This is just a daytime shot. It's uh, at Whitecliffe Park in West Vancouver. And uh, daytime diving is probably what most people do most of the time, certainly us. Um, but we also go diving at night because uh, night diving does a couple of things. One, it's generally a whole bunch of different species come out at nighttime than are visible in the daytime. It's much, it's sort of like a, the, the, there's like a day shift and a night shift is what how people generally refer to it. So you'll see things at night that you don't see during the daytime. The other thing at nighttime is that you have to use a dive light and shining a dive light around, you can't look around anywhere else. You have to look where the light is. So the light tends to focus your attention. So you see things a little better. So I find night diving really enjoyable because it focuses your attention. Um, and it's just, it, it sort of almost takes away all the other distractions. Even though again, more funny looks in the parking lot when at 10 and 10 PM at night, you're walking into the ocean. So that's a little bit about diving and how we, how we go about doing it. The other thing I wanted to say is that this is not going to be an exhaustive list. I think I said that at the beginning of every critter you're ever going to see in house sound. We just, 
don't have that kind of time. So I'm going to try and stay in my own lane. And my own lane is I'm a, I'm a fish nerd at heart. So I, I, I sort of gravitate towards fish, but, uh, but how sound has an amazing diversity of invertebrates and I will try to try to do uh, them justice this evening as well, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on some of the sort of minute sort of ultra nerdy things that, uh, that some folks might be aware of. So how sound I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to probably assume here that most people know where how sound is and what it's all about. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Here's just a quick map showing how sound there's Vancouver. It's sort of North of us. It's a fjord. Uh, there's a convenient road that runs right up beside it, which uh, gives access to the ocean, which is great. It'd be nice if there were a few more spots as, as uh, mentioned earlier, as the population of Vancouver grows, the, the uh, the use in parks is is gets excessive at times, especially in the summertime, and uh, it'd be nice to have a few more places that you can access the ocean with. So uh, everyone's probably seen this one. If anyone's ever been to Whitecliff Park in West Vancouver, a very popular dive spot, and it's and it's and it's um, an amazing dive spot. I've heard people that have been diving for a while. They'll say, "Oh, Whitecliff, yeah, I used to go there. I don't go there really anymore. I've seen it all." Well, I'd argue that you haven't, because at Whitecliff Park, there are there's a shallow sloping bay that slopes down to as deep as you care to go. There's a sheer rock wall um, uh, to the right in this picture, um, as well as to the left, actually, off the front of that little islet. There's bouldery areas. There's... Um, there's also uh, rocky sort of outcrops that support an amazing diversity of animals. So it's uh, uh, so it, it's it, it's probably 30 or 40 different dives at one dive site. And you could you could almost say the same with Porto. This is Porto Cove on the way up towards Squamish on the Sea to Sky Highway, just south of Furry Creek. And um this is a this is another really great spot. It's uh, it's a little less diverse, I would say, than than Whitecliff Park, but it has a charm all its own and and habitats and critters that you don't see at Whitecliff. You see them here. So sort of, a, I know what what did this guy do with the money his parents gave him for graphic designer school? I spent it on scuba gear, and and diving. So this is why the diagram looks a little bit sort of um public schoolish sorry about that but anyway so but it just gives a, a sort of a rough cross section of how sound generally of course there's a myriad of more uh complexity to the real thing but generally what i'm going to be talking about tonight are the slope sloping soft bottom bay the rocky outcrops and the wall and how sound uh as as i as i mentioned earlier is a fjord and it is is characteristically steep sided and very deep and it's uh it, it goes a lot deeper than uh than scuba divers will so i'm going to try to not bite off more than i can chew so the first thing i'm going to dispense with are the marine mammals that we see because i don't know anything about them and marty might talk about them next next month so um Harbor seals, we see them uh, fairly regularly. This is a little seal pup that seemed to like to hang on to Lisa. Um, not sure where, if mom was around or if there was still that going on, uh, but we do see, see harbor seals. The other thing about harbor seals is that will, they will hunt using your dive light at night. So when you're doing night dives, swimming into the shallows and all the fish sleeping on the bottom on the sand, the seals will use your light to try to hunt those. We try not to shine the light on the fish because it's a little unfair, but uh, but the seals have figured that out. Uh, lately, there's been a lot of sea lions in House Sound as well. Um, most notably, the, there's a group at Port Oak Cove um, at the moment, and uh, and they zoom past us. And of course, I always have the wrong lens on. This is a, a photo from my friend Nicole uh, who. Uh, let me use this photo because I haven't actually gotten a photo of, of a orca or killer whale in, in house sound yet, but we have had them follow us right into the bay at White Cliff on one occasion. Um, there's been no documented attacks of people, uh, of, of orcas or killer whales attacking people, but I certainly had no interest in being the first. 
So a uh, quick disclaimer before we get into the habitats, the, the marine life hasn't seen or approved this, my habitat drawing, and, and I make every effort to sort of depict the species, their typical habitats, but exceptions certainly occur. So the, the first um, habitat we'll talk about is the, the soft, uh, the sloping soft bottom bay. Usually I'm going to call it zero to 30 meters. It's my talk. I get to decide, I think. So it's zero to about 100 feet. Uh, the bottom is soft materials such as sand, silt, mud, shell hash. Shell hash is um, it's the uh, the shells of mussels that are all sort of bashed up and, and barnacles and other sort of hard shelled things that get all sort of mashed together. And it ends up being this very white, um, but very sort of um, heterogeneous mixture of of textures and colors and stuff um but it's it's small and it you know, obviously sits on the bottom rocky outcrops can be uh present sometimes um they are there sometimes not seasonally warmer water in the first six meters or 20 feet so seasonally warmer just means in the summer there's a warm layer that sits on top which is usually about six meters or 20 feet thick that's the that's the uh, that's that's a really um, welcome thing in the summer when we're doing technical dives and we have stage decompression to do before we can surface. And our last stop is in that warm layer. And it's it's absolutely glorious having spent the last you know hour and a half um, in in very cold water. I have a glass of water with me. So that if I pause, that's what I'm doing. Um, and then there's seasonal um, ambient light, depending on the depth. Obviously, the shallower you are, the more light there'd be. As you go deeper, it, it fades. Pardon me. So probably the first thing we see is um, shiner perch. Um, they're often at your feet as you're standing in the water, ready to to finish up your checks and get into the water. Um, shiner perch, uh, they sit around um, on the bottom at night in their night coloration. Um, it's sort of similar to this. They get a very barred pattern. And uh, they form, unfortunately, one of the major sort of forage species for a lot of other um, bigger fish species, which we'll see uh, a little later on. There's a there's a lot of flat fish um, species, and uh, Donna, if um, you're still there, you can tell me about all the uh, misidentified species later. Um, but anyway, I think this is a speckled sand uh, flat fisher. I find them very difficult. They all kind of look very similar, except for a few um, exceptions. But uh, these sand dabs are are everywhere in, in the shallow, soft bottom um, areas. The other thing we see are uh, these pink starfish and they get huge. They get uh, from sort of tip to tip, they would easily get 60 centimeters, maybe even a little bit bigger. Um, and and they uh, and they're general, we generally see them on soft bottoms in relatively shallow water. The other thing we see from time to time are these, um, Commensal scale worms, I think that's what that is. A commensal scale worm uh, living on the on the star on the on the on the pink stars. We don't see them on all of them, but we see them on some of them. So it being commensal, I'm, I'm assuming that the worm gets some sort of nutrition from the activities of of the star. The other thing we see are bay gobies. Um, now we don't see them at. Uh, uh, in all places um, where we go diving. We only see them actually in one, and that's at Porto Cove. I'm sure they occur in other places, but that's the only place that I've ever seen them. And they uh, they make burrows in the in the soft sediment, and they, they'll sit there uh, while you're trying to take a picture. They're pretty good if you approach slow and, and everything, but they, uh, they'll disappear into the hole once they're startled. One of my, uh, I really like, I really like these guys because they're the the stubby rose anemone. Um, they're they're usually hanging on to something that's under the substrate, a rock or something that's hard, and then they they uh, they present their tentacles sort of flat against the bottom, and they're waiting for something to walk or swim by within reach, probably walk by, but every once in a while you see them with shrimp in them, and I think this is a Snyder's blade shrimp. I think so. It's not a great picture of one, and it's heavily cropped, so uh, so my ID might be suspect. But uh, every once in a while, we see them with shrimp in them, and the shrimp 
probably get some protection from the anemone. It's there's probably uh, fishy shrimp eating fish that probably would would pass it up for a safer option somewhere else. And the anemone may get some benefit from the shrimp. It's uh, I don't know if that's the case or not. The other thing we see is we see a lot of nudibranchs in the shallow areas and on the on the soft bottoms. Often on the soft bottoms, there's um, bryzoans um, stocked uh, species like this, and they uh, and the um, the flabellinas. This one in case the red flabellina eats those. Uh, so it's it it's you see a lot of those. The other one we see from time to time are the white line dironas. These guys, uh, typically we see them on the bottom, don't really see them eating anything, but I'm sure they eat uh, obviously some other, um, some type of cnidarian or some sort of stinging cell thing uh, somewhere, but uh, I haven't seen them do that yet. And then there's model sea stars. So there's a few other uh, types of um, sea stars in the shallower areas. As we move our way down, uh, generally, uh, the the bottom in some places remains quite soft. In other places, it starts to get a little pebbly and rock, uh, rocky. So you see other species. One of the other species that we do see is striped nudibranchs, and the the striped nudibranchs are uh, are um, not as common, but we do see them fairly regularly. And these guys eat sea pens. So on the on the left there, there's a that's what a C pen looks like that's not being eaten. Every once in a while, and I don't know if you can see on the big picture on the left, but there are shrimp on sitting on that C pen. And I took a close up uh, on one of the dives, and there's the shrimp sitting on the C pen in the top right. On the bottom right, there's a mob of uh, striped uh, nudibranchs eating a C pen. So they've plumbed all, all, all over it, and the sea pen is trying to retract into the uh, below the substrate level to deter them, but uh, they hang on pretty good. Uh, we also see clown nudibranchs. And we see them often laying eggs. Uh, they have um, their eggs are kind of almost like a, a wine color, at least the ones that that I've seen, or at least one of them I've seen. The other uh, one of the fish we see quite a bit of, especially during the daytime, although they're small, they're brown, they don't move a lot. So you got to uh, sort of have have quite a sharp eye to see these things. Usually what happens is I see things based on movement, which I'm sure that's for most folks. Once you get a search, search image, it often is easier to find them after that. But until you get that, all they have to move is their eyes or maybe just their wiggle their pectoral fin one little time, and then that's it. You see them, um, and they're usually right around. So anyway, so these guys are, are, are pretty common in sort of shallower areas. That One of the species that inhabits the shell hash areas that I was talking about earlier is, is the spiny nose sculpin. And this is a male, and he gets a five o'clock shadow uh, on his face. Um, and, and that's how you can tell that's a male. That they get really pretty when they're uh, in the winter time when they're when they're getting ready to spawn. The slender coxcomb again. It's this. This is a little bit deeper down and usually associated with some kind of cover with uh, rocks and the ability to sort of burrow and make little crevices um, between them and under them, that sort of thing, and. Uh, and we've seen these guys um, fighting, two males fighting uh, over, probably over territory or over a good spawning site. Um, the other, again, a little bit deeper down. As the slides go, that's the sort of the trend. We'll start off shallow and go deeper. But uh, eventually we start seeing Velcro sea stars. And uh, these guys are absolutely formidable. They're The other name for them is fish-eating sea star. And it's like, how does a sea star catch a fish? Well, these guys are really good at it because what they have, that Velcro name, probably comes from the fact that they got all these little um, jaws, jaw-like structures on their on the, on the outside. Excuse me, I don't really know all the morphology of a sea star. So these little um, jaws, and they snap shut whenever something touches them, and they're covered in them. So you can imagine if anything ever touched those, 
they're not getting away. And that's unfortunately what happened to this poor little flatfish. So he got stuck to the Velcro star or this fish eating star and ended up as, as dinner probably. The other star we see quite a bit, um, a little deeper down, are brittle stars, the gray brittle stars, and they occur in mats in places. And uh, the bottom is usually you can't put a finger down on the bottom without either touching one or being very close to one. So they're all over the place, quite uh, quite common. Uh, we see crimson anemones. Crimson anemones are really interesting. Uh, Aside from being really pretty to look at, uh, they also seem to harbor a, a, a community of shrimp. And you can see there's, there's one down here. There's a couple in here. And there's a bunch over here. There's another one over here. So every time we see um, these Cribronopsis, these uh, the crimson stars, or sorry, crimson anemones, I always look at the base of them to look to see what shrimp um, are associated with. Uh, we did at Porto Cove one time found uh, find a uh, uh, oh, what's the really pretty one called candy, candy striped shrimp a candy striped shrimp uh, around the base of one of these uh, cribronopsis. But here's sort of a close up of the whole situation where you have these and again I think it's a Snyder's but don't quote me. Um, so the, the here's the shrimp hanging out. It probably gets protection from being eaten by um, other stuff that doesn't want to that don't want to get too close to the anemone. But I don't know if the anemone really gets anything out of it. I've never seen them really climbing on top of them, although I'm sure that may have happened at some point. Here's a really interesting one. Uh, we did a dive at uh, a couple of dives actually at Porto, but instead of going out to the north, um, we went to the south on our scooters so we could uh, we could go a little ways. And we got to sort of this rubble field that was, was uh, it looked like a miniature forest of, um, I'm guessing, combinations of bryzoans and algae. And and uh, um, and on top of these structures that were sitting a few inches off the bottom were these worms, these white-lined ribbon worms. And you, you, I don't know if you guys can see this, but um, on my monitor here, I can see that the worm has filled with all these little balls. So I'm wondering if that was, if it was a spawning uh, aggregation, because there was, there was probably, there was probably a hundred of these things, all in a in a fairly big area, but they were almost everywhere, and that that's the only time we'd ever seen them in that sort of massing. And I believe it was in the, win in the winter time, but I'd have to check the dates on the slides. So nighttime, when nighttime comes, uh, everyone always asks, well, what do you guys see down there? And my dive buddy always tells them we see sharks. Well, here's the shark that we normally see. It's this Pacific spiny dogfish. They uh, they separated, or they, yeah, they separated the Atlantic um, and the Pacific into two species. So now we have Squalus succlii, which is kind of a sucky name, but, uh, and Squalus acanthius is the Atlantic spiny dogfish. But we do see those from time to time. Um, they come very close to us. They uh, they don't seem to be bothered by the lights too much, as you can tell by the picture. This one came sort of headed straight for me. I had the wherewithal to lift the camera and take a picture. A little less dramatic. We see uh, Krangon shrimp at night. We don't see them during the daytime. I suppose it's possible, but we don't usually see that. And you just usually you make eye contact with the shrimp, or the Krangon, and then it stalls for just a minute and then wiggles it into the substrate. And all you can see is its eyes. And then the uh, the Dungeness crabs that we that we sort that we sort of see during the daytime, not very often out and about but occasionally, and more often we just see their eyeballs and their little um, um, antenna wiggling around, sticking out of the sand. But at nighttime, you find out what they're really up to. Um, and this was amazing. Talk about, you know, can you use an extra hand to get into your dinner? And this guy's pulling apart a, a, a clam, obviously. The other... Um, crustacean we see quite a lot of especially at nighttime are the black-eyed hermits we see them during the day as well but uh the black-eyed hermits we see them a lot 
Um, they're very common in certain places. And this one, I don't know if you can see it, but it, um, it should be able to. Um, he's eating the, sh it looks like the molt of a shrimp and and the, the crab is eating him, eating it. Nothing goes wasted. So uh, the cool thing is, is that how sound British Columbia actually has a seahorse relative in our water. It's in the same uh, group as as tropical seahorses, Signathidae, and this is our bay pipefish. And it comes in um, a multitude of colors. I've seen them green, light green, dark green. I've seen them almost black. This one's kind of red, um, and uh, and they they usually are trying to blend in with some kind of algae or some sort of um, substrate of some kind, but um, blend blending in with sort of just grayish brown um, soft sediment, probably a little bit of a challenge. Uh, so this guy was kind of, kind of easy to see. One of the, one of the uh, sort of uh, sculpins that we don't see almost at all during the daytime, uh, but we do see them at nighttime are staghorn sculpins, Pacific staghorn sculpins. These are the kind of, really common um, sculpins that everyone sort of seems to know, but it's, I find that odd because we don't see them very shallow. So it's, it, you'd have to almost be a diver to see them. And then you only see them really at night is when they come out. And that's the only time they sit on top of the substrate and, and go hunting. And the, and the, uh, the inset there on the, on the left-hand side, lower left is what happens as soon as you make eye contact and shine your light on them, they kind of start wiggling into the substrate to kind of hide themselves. Uh, spot prawns. I, I was going to put in a picture that had a side view that kind of looked like, okay, here's what it looks like from the side, but I thought I'd put this one in because this is our view of spot prawns at nighttime. They love our lights. They seem to just be attracted to our lights. Maybe it's us they like, I'm not sure. But uh, they come walking right up to you, and uh, and it, it's pretty fun to to see them. But they they make diurnal migrations from deeper water at uh, during the daytime into shallower water at night, and that's when we see them. Same goes for the pink shrimp. These guys, this one's a little bit more blue than than what they normally look like. Um, should be a, a little bit more pink, but that might be the light. The other cool fish that uh, that we see again at nighttime, and usually mostly in the winter, although we have seen them in the summer a little bit. Mostly it's a winter thing. Mostly it's a nighttime thing, and that's a black belly eel pout. Um, I don't know where they go during the day if they make the diurnal uh, migrations from deeper water or not. I'm not really sure, but uh, we do see them in the winter at night in relatively shallow water over soft bottom. And then the spear nose poacher, uh, sort of in the same group as the pygmy poacher, but this one's quite a bit bigger, and uh, and it's very very common to see uh, these guys. Uh, Roughback sculpins, probably one of the most uh, common sculpins we see at nighttime. The uh, these guys they kind of look angry and sort of mean all the time. Maybe that's just the angle of the face, but there's probably a reason for that. They eat shrimp. And um, oftentimes you'll shine your light on a shrimp and then all of a sudden the shrimp disappears and the shrimp is now in the mouth of something that used your light to, to be able to get to eat it. Um, roughback sculpins also um, are kind of liberal in their choices. They'll also eat uh, pygmy poachers. So this one's got it sort of sideways in his mouth. It's kind of hard because the poacher blends into the bottom really quite well. So uh, hopefully you can see that. And then the, I've only ever seen one of these, um, the sturgeon poacher. So we don't see these very often. So that um, in terms of poachers, the pygmies, you see them um, all day long uh, during the day. The spear nose, you see them all day or all night long, I guess, during the night. And these guys, you see them very rarely. Um, of the flatfish, this was one of the more distinctive uh, species that I was referring to, the CO sole. I like these guys uh, only because they're easy to identify. Here's the C and there is the O. All right, yeah, I guess that would be the O. There's also a spot here. But um, 
And we've seen spawning aggregations of these guys where a whole pile of them get together, they stir up the bottom. Uh, we didn't actually see the ascent in the water column, but we're pretty sure that that's what was going on. Uh, famous fish on our, on our West Coast, known for all sorts of bizarre behavior. But uh, the plain fidman shipman, again, we see them mostly at night, mostly on soft bottoms, sometimes associated with rocky areas that have soft bottom areas tucked in inside or, you know, on them. And then uh, they spawn uh, in the spring, I guess, in the summer, spring into summer, in the intertidal, which is totally bizarre, I think. I think that's incredible. So you can actually go on low tide, turn over rocks, and find a, a male uh, midshipman looking after his brood uh, in the middle of summer. And then come the late summer um, into fall, what we see are the little juveniles swimming in the in the water column. I put the September, that's not the name of the fish, but that's just the month in which we generally see them. And it's a fairly regular seasonal occurrence. Here's another one-off. Uh, it's the only uh, um, big skate that we, that I've ever seen in House Sound. So they are there because this was a small one. This one was was probably a, a, a pup, not probably not more than, you know, maybe a few months old if. It was quite small. We see spot fin sculpins. Those are also very common, but they're much they're uh, a little bit deeper down. These guys are probably in the 20 to 25 meter or what is that? 60 something odd feet, something like that. Maybe a little bit deeper and uh, readily identified by the black spot in the dorsal fin, as long as the extension on the first ray of the dorsal fin right here. First spine, I should say. And then the black spot here tells you you're looking at a spot fin sculpin. Oops, sorry. Um, I thought these, I, I, I didn't know what this was up until uh, maybe a couple of years ago. Yeah, probably a couple of years ago. Because we started doing some deeper technical dives. And I kept seeing these little brown fish sitting on the bottom. And I thought, what are these things? So I took a picture. And then uh, uh, um, Danny Kent, uh, the curator of, of BC Waters, or uh, the, I, I'm not sure what they call it now, but... Um, the cold water section at the aquarium helped me identify it. And uh, we came up with slim sculpin and uh, now we see them. I see them quite regularly, but they are deeper. It's usually, I've only seen one shallower than a hundred feet. Usually they're deeper than that. Again, this is uh, this was another one-off observation in, in house sound. Uh, hadn't seen them in all the years prior. And then suddenly there they were. And there was a few of them, uh, blue barred, barred, barred prickleback. And uh, I, I don't know much about these. I don't know if they're a deep water species or they're just not that common in, in places like House Sound. What is common in House Sound, though, are stubby squid. So for the uh, cephalopod uh, group, the, um, the stubby squids stubby squid is uh, very common and they also prey on uh, small shrimp so often you can see the shrimp antenna sticking out from the bottom of the of this of this of the squid and of course there's giant pacific octopus generally soft bottom but they're associated with rocky areas as well they're associated with walls i mean they're they're kind of all over the place whatever is a suitable habitat but at nighttime we often see them out walking around on the walking around on the uh, on the soft bottom in shallower and shallower areas i just thought this was a funny picture it's an octopus you know um there's outside the den it's scattered bits and pieces of different crabs and stuff and here it is a long nose uh decorator crab eating um what's left of another kind of crab so yeah so rocky outcrops uh Again, from zero to 100 feet, associated with the bottom of soft material um, as well. The rocky outcrops appropriate uh, offer appropriate settling substrate. So settling just refers to, it's a sort of a, we, I use it as a biological term for animals that would drift in the plankton and then eventually settle out and begin life or, you know, carry on with life uh, on a hard substrate. Rocky outcrops provide that. Uh, can be shallow, can be deep um, and seasonable light. Uh, 
seasonable ambient light is depth dependent, of course. So obviously the purple sea stars, uh, we still see them in, in good numbers. So I'm happy to report that. Unfortunately, uh, we don't see a lot of sunflower stars yet. So that, that may still be a thing. And every once in a while we come across a star that is sort of dissolving away still. So I'm not really sure where all that uh, science and issue sits. Um, because of the lack of sunflower stars in Howe Sound, or at least where we dive, uh, the places that we've been to, there's been um, definitely a population increase of green urchins. Um, there's not, even in the summertime, there's not a lot of kelp in the shallower areas that the sea urchins can reach. So uh, probably the most common sculpin in the rocky areas are, have to be the scaly head sculpins. These guys are are, are great to, um, to watch. They have these very dramatic lives they lead. Sometimes they're really colorful. Um, sometimes they're not. They're kind of muted like this, or they're very pretty like that. And uh, in the wintertime, or sorry, I'm skipping ahead, um, they also eat shrimp. If you're getting the idea that shrimp are sort of food, uh, are a major food item in the in in the ecosystem, you're you're right on the money. So in the winter time, what happens is uh, all the empty giant barnacle shells get occupied, the good ones anyway, the ones with a bit of flow around them and stuff, and uh, and usually you can see a male scaly head sculpin sticking his head out of the of the opening, soliciting females to go that come come by to lay eggs in his barnacle shell. And you can see in the inset bottom left, uh, that particular male sculpin had had, um, I think it was uh, six different females lay eggs in in his um, barnacle. The other interesting thing about these guys, and I'd love to get a good picture of it, is inside their mouth, they have these little dots that look a lot like the eggs. So I wonder if they use that to entice the female in. The other uh, very... Uh, common sculpin, but not as, is uh, the long fin sculpin, a delightfully looking looking fish. I find all the red and the, and the yellow and all that kind of stuff, really, uh, it's a pretty fish. The anal fin, uh, which you can't see in this picture, unfortunately, is all bright yellow. But in the wintertime, this is in the wintertime, uh, the males turn, their, their pectoral fins turn almost black and their faces get really dark. Their whole body goes so that from that red to a, a brown, dark, sort of um, earthy color. The females kind of just get a little bit paler. They're not so red as they are in the in the non-breeding season. And you can see that this, this pair's got a, well, not, not this pair, but this male has a group of eggs here and a group of eggs here. And he's probably trying to either convince her or convince her that when she's done, she can leave because he needs to solicit the next female. And that uh, that takes place in the wintertime. So around this time of year, it's it's uh, it's interesting to go diving in these spots and going looking for the things that you know uh, have all these interesting behaviors this time of year. Grunt sculpin, I think everybody's favorite, uh, who's ever um, run into them, seen them. They uh, they walk on their pectoral fins, These uh, these fins down here. Uh, and ventral fins, sorry, ventrals, not pectorals. These are the pecs. And then the ventral fins. So they kind of walk on their ventral fins. They don't really swim. I don't know that I've ever actually ever seen a grunt sculpin swim. Uh, and then there's northern ronquils, probably the fish uh, most single-handedly responsible for me moving out to the West Coast besides, you know, career and all that stuff. Um, I just really like them. During the, during the summertime, they're kind of a little bit muted colors, They're but they have... They have an interesting shape. They uh, and in the winter time, the males get really pretty. They get uh, almost blue and black um, uh, ventral fins, and then their anal fin that runs along the bottom here goes bright blue. And this one isn't quite fully colored up yet, but this is moving into spawning season. And of course, no discussion about biodiversity of anywhere in BC would be complete without mention of black-eyed gobies. They're absolutely everywhere, um, so they're the they're the probably the most uh, abundant goby species in BC, and certainly in Howe Sound. And uh, and these guys again um, 
have lead very dramatic lives. They're always squabbling over territories. Uh, they're digging out burrows between rocks and under rocks. And these guys spawn during the summer. So in June, we'll go diving and get underneath that thick plankton layer. And then this guy has a big, he's guarding a big plaque of eggs stuck to the underside of a rock. So you can see all that drama going on uh, in the summertime, in the lead up to the summertime. Uh, greenlings, uh, they're also uh, well represented with painted greenlings. We don't see them as often, but they are there. And there's kelp greenlings, which of course are quite common. This is a male uh, kelp greenling. This is a female, quite different. Uh, they're quite shy of divers. I think uh, we look too much like seals and probably seals eat these things. I mean, I would if I was a seal, they look like they're mostly meat. Um, and then in the in the winter time they lay eggs, so they're all busy laying eggs. Um, well, might be sort of tail end of that now, but um, these are the eggs in the uh, and they they either stick them inside the giant barnacles if no one's home, or they they sort of cluster them in where they're going to be held in place. And this is a close up of the eggs, the little greenlings developing in there. Also in the lingcod, or sorry, the, the greenling group is the lingcod. Lingcods uh, have an amazing sort of a ecology about them. Uh, a large predatory fish, they'll get to well over a meter long, um, meter and a half, uh, I think at least. And then um, their, their diet ranges from everything from shiner perch, which I mentioned at the very beginning, all the way up to a full-size salmon. So this one was uh, was in the, and I didn't have a, a wide angle lens on there. Otherwise I would have shot the whole fish, but um, all I had was something smaller. So I had to settle for this, but it gives you an idea that uh, it was a big salmon that went down the hatch there. And then there's species that actually do cleaning. Uh, so the link cod, oftentimes you swim up sort of, or get near one and you'll see it sitting there with its mouth open. And if it's sitting there with its mouth open, chances are there's somebody in its mouth doing some cleaning. In this case, it's a coonstripe shrimp, but in other cases we've we've seen and and obviously I've read about um, uh, longfin uh, gunnels doing the same job. But um, oh, and then they lay their eggs at this time of year. Well, they're usually sitting on the males are sitting on eggs by this time of the year, of the year, and the males are all beat up and battle scarred from scrapping over females and over spawning sites. And here's the shrimp that uh, everybody seems to find so palatable. Um, I think this is the rough patch. There's another one that looks quite similar. It's called the dock shrimp, but I, I'm pretty sure this is the rough patch. And the rough patch shrimp, they kind of bring it on themselves. Sometimes they're very bold and they'll just, they'll sit right there while you take pictures. But I wonder if they sit right there, if I was a rockfish. So some of the other shrimp, um, that we see the elegant coastal shrimps. We see a lot of those. We don't see very many stiletto shrimps and they're almost almost always associated with some sort of um, kelp or algae. And the pigmented uallids, we see a lot of those if you just have to look um, hard enough. They're barely a couple of centimeters long. So they're quite small, but they're very pretty um, and usually uh, uh, laden with eggs. And then there's the Dana's blade shrimp. I think that's what that one is. Um, and those those ones come in a variety of colors. So it's sometimes not so easy to uh, identify it. But these guys are all um, denizens of the sort of the rocky areas. Also, um, hermits, we see lots of hermits. Usually it's wide hands that we see. And this is just, you know, the right hand is is a lot wider than the, than the left one. Uh, so that's where they get their name. Every once in a while, we see these guys, the orange hermits, uh, the gilli. We used to see them quite often, but we don't see them as much anymore. And I don't know if that's a trend or if it's something seasonal or if we're just not diving at the right time. But uh, but we we aren't seeing as much of those anymore that we than we used to. Uh, graceful decorator crab. I swear to you, folks, there is a crab in this picture. Um, it's really hard to uh, see what what's what but here's a little bit of a shot this guy's taking some sponge and, and it makes it a little bit of an easier uh, easier way to uh, id the, the crab and then the other decorator crab is the longhorn 
I think I said long nose before. What I meant was longhorn crab, decorator crab. Uh, these guys are all over the place uh, in rocky areas. And uh, same with rhinoceros crab. This is another type of crab. It's amazing. These guys can molt and then end up with all those little hairy bits um, intact. It's, it's quite a feat. And uh, we see them crawling around on the bottom as well. This one was just on a nice background, so it was it stands out pretty well. But sometimes they blend right in. And the only way you can see see one is if you see the orange bits. And then there's Puget Sound king crabs. This one's eating a sea star. Looks like a blood star, maybe. I'm not sure. And then the juveniles, they're, as soon as your dive light goes on them, they just light up bright orange. They're small. They can be small, but they light up bright orange, and it's it's hard to mistake them for anything else. And some of the other sea stars that we see, um, there's the the uh, the rose stubby rose, then there's or the rose star. Uh, there's a vermilion star top right, uh, bottom right's a spiny red, and then the the blood star in the bottom left. We see giant plumose anemones. So those are quite common in some areas. They're not sort of universal throughout all, all the sites, but if there's a, uh, they, and they generally need a hard, hard substrate. So you don't see them in the bay or the shallow soft bottom areas. We see them on the rocky spots. Same with swimming in enemies, uh, Stomphia. We need, they need somewhere hard to hang on to, uh, but we see those uh, quite often as well. And more rarely, we don't see a lot of these, uh, is the painted anemones in in House Sound? Uh, I put uh, I I I chickened out by trying to put a name onto this one. I'm not sure if it's the brown or I think it's the brown, but I'm not sure. So I just put cup coral. Forgive me, Donna. And then uh, we also see orange zoanthids. Oh, I, sorry. So there are corals in House Sound. Just so you know, there's just not the fancy ones. Um, if you don't think that's fancy. So uh, orange zoanthid, uh, these guys, um, we see huge patches of this. There's a couple of places that we go to where there's an entire section of wall just carpeted. It looks like a giant shag carpet hung on the wall, and it's all, all these um, orange zoanthids. There's urchins. There's the giant red urchin. They make great weirdo kind of graphic-y type of pictures. I kind of Imagine this to be some futuristic city somewhere from some other alien planet. That's kind of what urchins remind me of anyway. Uh, we see a lot of calcareous tube worms of all kinds of different colors. There's uh, white crowned calcareous tube worms that we see. Uh, we also see red gilled nudibranchs. Uh, very similar looking to the red fab flabellina, but there are some differences there. We see golden dironas. These these ones actually can get quite big. We see them uh, quite regularly, and they have a definitely have a, a spawning season, which we typically see. But now I'm trying to remember if that was winter or it might be fall. I'm not. I can't remember now. I'd have to. I'd have to look at the dates on the on the slides. And then a couple of times in House Sound, um, once at Porto and once uh, when we we're out on the top line we saw a sort of a mass spawning aggregation of shag rug nudibranchs. So there's the egg, um, the egg clusters up in the top right there. And, and it just looked like a shag carpet, a big section of the bottom just covered in these things. So that was kind of neat. But every once in a while, you see the one off here and there. Not that often, though. Um, but we see the spawning aggregations from time to time. And we don't see it every year. So a plunging wall. So 30 to 60 meters, let's go a little deeper, 100 to 200 feet. There's, uh, it's usually rock. It's, we've got pockets of sand and mud. Soft bottom shoots. The shoots are just strips of sand running between the rocks. The seasonally, the water temperature is more constant. It's usually plus or minus a couple of degrees. And it's warmer than the shallow winter water. So at this time of year, the shallow water is now colder than the water that sits underneath it. So the uh, so it's it's actually kind of nice to get down a little bit deeper because the water's warmer this time of year. Now, when I say warmer, I'm still talking about seven to eight degrees Celsius. So it depends on how you define warm. And seasonal ambient light is possible um, at these depths, 
under ex extremely rare circumstances, most of the time, once you get below, you know, uh, I, it's hard to, to give you an actual number, but once you get deep enough, it's, it's going to be dark. It's just, it's, it's, it turns into a bit of a night dive. So on the walls, we, we find Cribronopsis. Apparently there's two species of cribs, Cribronopsis, but I've chickened out and just called them the same um, thing. So forgive me for that. We see feather stars that stick on the wall as well um, with all their um, arms stuck, stuck out into the uh, flow that runs past the wall. Uh, big feeding opportunity also it helps to disperse their off their uh, their eggs and um, when it comes spawning time. Speaking of eggs, here's a lingcod sitting on a cloud sponge. The cloud sponges usually start at around 100 feet or 30 meters. You don't see them too much shallower than that. If you do, they're very small. They're sort of tucked in a spot. They're not really making a big go of it. But nice. Big complex cloud sponges like this start at about uh, 30 meters or 100 feet. And you can see it on this particular day, there was some ambient light, but you go much deeper and there, and there wasn't. And there's a lingcod sitting in here with some, I have to say, uh, poorly placed eggs. These eggs are tucked into the sponge up against the wall. They're probably not going to get enough flow. They probably won't survive. Sponges come in all sorts of uh, different shapes. Um, for sure, this one had three giant funnels on it, it looked like. Um, that's Lisa hovering above it for some scale. And then the sponges themselves become are, are essentially communities, much like trees, I guess. They have all sorts of other animals that make their home. Um, this is the Kincaid shrimp. And um, very diagnostic, the white line on the snout is easy identifier for those guys but usually um, sponges have a bunch of these guys uh, in them they also have decorated war bonnets which are a, a diver's favorite uh, not uh, not easily seen by uh, by non-divers that's for sure unless you go to the aquarium but um but yeah these guys hang out in sponges as well crabs do and there's a whole bunch of other things but in the necessity of time i thought i would uh narrow the choices um we also see tiger rockfish further down on the wall so these are very strikingly colored rockfish very shy um don't don't um hang around long once they see us the other thing we see is yellow eye rockfish this is a sort of an almost adult i guess i guess it mostly almost adult boy that's not very definitive is it um but this was this was at almost 200 feet and this is the only place i've ever seen uh, the adults. Usually what we see in shallower water are the juveniles. So that's the same species. That's the adult, that's the juvenile. And the juveniles we usually see um, down on rocky habitats or in rocky habitats down, down a little bit lower, but not so deep. So the juveniles are easily seen by scuba divers, the adults are not. And another um, sort of nerd fish, um, that's what I call it because you don't really not a lot of people know about it. Not a lot of people see it. Uh, um, it's the thornback sculpin. And if you could, if you could see them, there are all these little jagged little thorns running on either side of their dorsal fin down their backs. So there, that's an interesting find on a rocky ledge at, at a past hundred feet. And uh, again, and what discussion would be complete without a wolf eel? And uh, uh, we see wolf eels on the walls as well. We don't always see them deep but uh, it, it, they do like it a little bit deeper. This one was at a 140 feet. I, I don't always know the meters right off the top of my head, so 140 feet. And uh, I've actually seen in Howe Sound two six-gill sharks while swimming along the wall. And you can, you can guess, again, I didn't have the right lens on. But there's, there's the eye, there's, you can count them, it's real. But they came up, uh, the, in each time, they came up, had a look at us, and then wandered back into deeper water. So still plunging. This is 200 plus. Haven't done a lot of that, um, mostly because uh, it's the amount of equipment that needs to go with you. Uh, and on these dives, we generally don't take scooters because we have too many bottles to take, too many um, scuba cylinders to take with gas, because gas at 200 plus um, goes very quickly on open circuit. Uh, 
uh, open circuit is, you know, regular scuba where you exhale and bubbles go into the water. So there's usually rock, there's pockets. It's seasonally, the temperature is more constant. It's warmer than the shallow winter waters like before. And there's very little to no ambient light past 200. It doesn't matter how clear the water is. I haven't seen ambient lights at 200 feet yet. Um, and their sponges are still there. So the cloud sponges um, uh, go quite deep. The other thing that I was shocked to see was a green striped rockfish. I'd never seen one in a house sound before. I'd seen them on the Sunshine Coast um, at a place we go to called Tawanik, uh, which is a popular area for divers. And there's green striped rockfish all over the place there. But never seen one in house sound until here we are at, I think this was at about 220 feet, um, right off the point at Whitecliff Park. There's a green striped rockfish. I had no idea. So there's all kinds of surprises in house sound still to be seen. Um, this one I had to look up when I got back. I took the picture and thought, I have to identify that later. And it turns out to be a red striped rockfish. Turns out these guys are um, are, are seen in house sound, but quite deep. This was about 180 feet. Uh, so, yeah. So the other thing I wanted to sort of finish up with this quickly is some artificial reefs and modified habitats. And it's man-made structures, man-made modifications to natural habitats. And marine life is largely dictated by the structure, the depth, and the flow, of course, as it is in most places. But I thought a discussion about how sound marine biodiversity wouldn't be complete if I didn't sort of include those things because they do play a major role. So this is the Nakaya, a wooden... Uh, uh, minesweeper sunk um, in the park at Porto, and uh, it's falling apart quite rapidly, but it is host to a myriad of marine life. They love the wooden boats because I think they uh, they get more holes and nooks and crannies uh, eventually, which provides more complex structure. Uh, there's a lot of things that probably eat the wood that probably help to um, start a food chain going on. Um, we see a lot of ling cod on on the wreck of the on the on the artificial reef nakaya and we also see the long fin gunnels the cleaners that we're that i talked about earlier we see a bunch of those uh the uh the nakaya also has a lot of quillback rockfish that live on it that we see from time to time sometimes they're they're more plentiful and other times they're not so much but the interesting thing we see about the rockfish is that the the nakaya also attracts big schools of, or shoals, I should say, of shiner perch, and the rockfish feed on the shiner perch, sort of the lingcod. So that's kind of how that um, sort of dynamic works out. There's also, um, the Nakaya is covered in decorator crabs, longhorn decorator crabs. And it's also covered in galatheid crabs or squat lobsters, um, bright red, can't miss them. They usually, uh, if you approach them slowly, they'll let you get really close and they have beautiful blue eyes. And then the hairy spine crabs. These guys will also live in the sponges on the walls as well, as I mentioned earlier, but we see those on the Nakaya as well. So going north in Porto, this is standing in the parking lot looking north towards Furry Creek and Squamish. And the, all the rocks that they threw into the uh, or tumbled into the ocean when they're making the highway has turned into marine habitat, of course. So this is kind of what it looks like. There's a steep sloping wall there to the left of Lisa and the water column there. And the rocks are all sort of cascading down. And that slope goes down to a sort of a softer bottom at about 200, 220 feet. So it's uh, it's a it's a long rocky slope with boulders. Some of them as big as your house, and they get covered in uh, there's the ones in the in the right depth range, shallower depths where sunlight reaches. They get uh, covered in pink coral and algae, which is which is beautiful for photographs for sure. Um, we all we see we see shoals of yellow-tailed rockfish when we are on the scooters and we're going along what we call the quarter mile beside the highway, we we pass several shoals of yellowtail rockfish in the water column. Uh, here's the lingcod and there's the shiner perch. They're sitting there on the rocks looking up. So they're looking at the, for the silhouettes of the fish. The other things we see at the, at the quarter mile on the coral and encrusted rocks, 
are slime stars. It seems a disproportionate amount of slime stars out there than compared to almost anywhere else. And then there's also all those nooks and crannies between the rocks are a haven for black-eyed gobies and squat lobsters or galathaid crabs. But one of the surprises that uh, I found out there, and this was this was Donna was telling me about this. Um, Donna said, "Oh, you you got to find the 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 cleaner shrimp, the the mundus, the lebius mundus." And it's like what? And it's like, yeah, they're in the cracks of the rocks. So talk about photographic challenge, trying to stuff your camera rig in between two rocks. But um, but anyway, this is what a mundus look a mundus looks like when it's not cleaning and. I was lucky enough to get close enough to this lingcod to tolerate me getting a picture of his, hers, um, uh, Mundus, um, uh, Levius Mundus, uh, cleaning it. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then the uh, the charismatic mesofauna in the in the rocky area of the quarter mile has to be the red brochula, which we see on occasion, sort of half fish, half eel. And uh, and we don't see them very often, but uh, they are there. So the water column to finish this up, the habitats determined by temperature, salinity, and light, and the currents, obviously, at the mercy of the tide. So we see yellowtail rockfish up in the current. The interesting thing that I found that uh, I was doing a feeding uh, presentation, a fish feeding presentation at the aquarium one time, and and I I, I wanted to research some interesting feeding um, things and. One the one thing I found was that you see these yellowtail rockfish in the wild all the time, and they're up in the water column. And my first thought is, what are they eating? And it turns out it's pelagic tunicates make up the bulk of their diet. So I thought that was really interesting. And I don't know if that's in all parts of their range where where they come from, but certainly in the study area, that's what they found they were eating in the water column. So that's maybe that's why they spend a lot of time up there. And then we see these I call we call them bait balls. Um, trying to identify them. I don't know if they're anchovies or if they're herring or something else, but uh, we generally see those in the water column from time to time, which is kind of fun. We also see gelatinous zooplankton. Moon jelly is probably the most common, uh, but we also see fried eggs. That's probably the second most common one. And very rarely do we see the lion's mane jelly, uh, but they obviously they're a wrap. We do see at nighttime, we see some of the, the young critters that are just starting out life um, uh, on the rocky substrates. And in this case, this was a, a little octopus um, that has that was just starting to settle because um, it was still trans relatively transparent uh, in the water column. And then the other thing we see as a seasonal thing in the summertime is uh, red tide. So that's what this is. It's a um, you can see all the sort of the stuff hanging in the water column. I won't tell you what we call that, but um, but you can see how Lisa's uh, in this case, her air, the exhaust from her um, breathing is punching holes in the red tide above her. And then a little bit more dramatic. Um, you can see the red tide happening. So when everyone's saying, oh, the red tides in the ocean, we go running out there to try and get some decent pictures. So. I hope I haven't bitten off more than I can chew. I think I have. Um, I have bitten off more because there's way more biodiversity to house sound than what I've shown. It, that was just a glimpse, literally a glimpse of it. And uh, I just wanted to finish up by thanking my dive buddies because without them, none of this would be possible. My wife, Lisa, and our friend, Eric, on the left there. And that's how sound. That's it. Wow, thank you, Lee. Amazing photos and uh, your discussion on everything was was just perfect, uh, explaining you know, the different habitats and how the animals lived. And uh, yeah, we just all the comments are coming in now. Wonderful, fantastic. Uh, let me see if we have any questions for you. And uh, you are welcome sure. to unmute yourself and ask your question if you like. Um, oh, here's a good one. Um, do you carry any weapons in the event of an aggressive predator? No, I don't carry any weapons, <laughs> but um, we do have uh, 
tools that we use. So we have line cutters if we get tangled in fishing line, because that's a real um, sort of thing that could happen. And we also carry uh, a dive knife, which mine has a blunt end on it. It's not used for defending myself against marine life. It's more um, if I had to do something, I needed a tool um, to do something underwater for some reason. So yeah, no, um, our interactions with the wildlife are A, on their terms, um, and B, as long as you give animals uh, the respect and the space and, you know, the, um, that they deserve, then I've never had an, an aggressive encounter um, at all. Oh, yeah, that's really fortunate. But I, I think also, um, in general, we don't have so many aggressive animals here. Maybe the sea lions are perhaps the most aggressive you might find. Would you agree? Yeah, I do. I think sometimes the, the sea lions can get a little bit boisterous, especially when there's a bunch of them. They sort of, the you know, bravery in groups to like the 17 year olds behind 7-Eleven. But um, the uh, the only other thing that I, that I just remembered is I had an octopus once that didn't want to give my, my dive light back. So that was about it. That was just a tug of war. Yeah, I've had seals tug on my fins as well. And, uh, you know, yeah. you think it's your dive buddy and, and then you see your dive buddies like not behind you. It's a little bit right. battling, but <laughs> nothing dangerous. Um, had that on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, they're, sometimes they get a, a little bit friendly. Um, right. Linda is asking, are there herring spawning in House Sound now? Um, I I don't know the answer to that one. I'm sorry. I, I probably should know, but I I actually don't know if they're spawning. Hey, I think that maybe um kind of to generally answer that. I know they've had some success up by Squamish with the herring spawning there, uh, because yeah. I coded the um the the pilings from the oh right to cover yeah. the creosote, and they yeah. had some success with herring spawning there. I don't know if the timing is right now. It should be coming up in the next few weeks though. Oh, okay. um, yeah, something like that. Like usually around, I think the end of February or so, uh, mm. but it's variable. So uh, yeah. BJ is wondering, do you need to be certified on the scooters? And do you know if there's anywhere where they can be rented? Um, yes. And in BC, there's none, there's no place I know that rents them. I mean, that, that may not be entirely um, correct, but at least in my knowledge, I don't think you can rent them. The scooters that we use, um, you definitely need training to use those. They're not, um, as I sort of joke, they're not toys. They, um, they've been the cause of, uh, of at least one fatality that I know of not being operated properly. And, uh, they can, you can get into serious trouble if you're not careful with them you can they can get you to places that if the scooter fails you can't get out of you'd have to swim back and if it's rough on the surface that can be a problem um, just distance can be the problem uh, you could get cold you get tired you could you know all kinds of things so when so when we scooter we never scooter by ourselves we never use just one scooter we always have um, at least two usually we have three so what ends up happening is if someone's scooter has has stopped working, the other one of the other people, we have a there's a technique that you use to get sort of hooked up with the other person and they tow you. And it's all supposed to be streamlined and and organized so that there's hand signals back and forth, um, pressure signals back and forth. So, yeah, getting certified to use those things is a good idea. Um I just, uh, I don't know that that's regularly offered anywhere. You'd have to go to a specialty instructor for that. Uh, still along the line of the scooters, seeing as it came up, um, when you are diving, are they, what's their buoyancy? Are they neutral? Are they a bit negative, positive? Well, that's a good question because when you buy them, um, they come relatively neutral if you don't mess with them. But we've messed with ours. We've put a uh, an aluminum propeller on the back instead of the plastic one. Um, it gets us a little bit more power, a um, little bit more speed. But mostly it's to take away some of the failure points because the plastic propellers were failing 
every once in a while. Um, my wife, Lisa, had a propeller fall apart off her scooter one day. Oh. So I had to tow her back with mine. And then uh, so we, we put the aluminum ones on to to take away failure points. The other thing we did was we took out the nickel metal uh, hydride battery, which would last about two hours in cruise mode or third gear out of eight. And we put in lithium ion batteries that we that we built. Um, and those would go about five hours. So the much greater range, much greater um, sort of uh, power available if we run into currents or if we get off track somewhere. Um, but that th those two things make the scooter heavier. So what, what's ended up now is that they're a little bit negatively buoyant and usually negatively buoyant um, ours now with the with the aluminum prop they're they're sort of tail heavy propeller heavy so we've got a way that we uh, we take a little leash it's a it's a it's a bolt snap with a little piece of rope on it that we tie through the through the through the cowling of the, the scooter and then clip it up to a hip d-ring so it stays off the bottom when, when especially for me when i'm taking pictures I, I want to be as close to the bottom as I can be in at times, depending on the shot, but I do not want to be touching the bottom. And I don't want the scooter dragging on the bottom either. The lowest part of me when I'm taking pictures should be my belly. And I'm, and I'm very conscious of my belly all the time, but um, especially when diving, I want to make sure that I'm not rubbing my suit on the, on the, on the bottom. Well, it sounds like a, a little bit of complexity. There's going to be one more question coming up about that. But in the meantime, um, Rose and John, they must be from the aquarium, uh, would like to know why we don't have any of those cute little red squids at the aquarium. I think they're talking about the stubby squids. Yeah, that's a that's a really that's an excellent question because I, I always and I've had long conversations with Danny about that. Danny Kent, the curator of the BC section. Um, I had long conversations with him about it and they've tried a few times and it, it sort of hasn't really worked out very well. And I don't, I'm not sure why, but there's something about that species that just doesn't like to be in sort of a, a more enclosed area because for it to be able to, or to be able to feed it properly and enough, you need, um, it needs to have a sort of a habitat of its own. So it can't be in a very big display with a lot of other fish and inverts, invertebrates. Mm -hmm. So they have ended up it usually ended up being in sort of fairly mo modest confines of a, of a of a display. And then I, I don't know if it was a live food problem, like you had to feed it live food all the time, or whether it would accept dead food. I think I mean Danny might be able to tell us more about that at some point. But um, yeah, it's a good it's a good question, and I think it's a good uh, research problem. Uh, husbandry problem for to solve all right so we're coming back to the scooters um sheila, sheila was saying you mentioned that the scooter is connected to the bc and uh, she was just wondering if you could explain how you know what that's about well the bcs that we wear have what's called a crotch strap and it's a strap that goes from the bottom of the bc up the um, up between your legs and it connects to the um the waist strap and on that crotch strap, there's a D-ring that sits just in front, just below your belly. It would be just below your belly button when you're standing up in your suit. And then that's what we clip the scooter to. So the scooter then pulls on that crotch strap, but it's pulling on the whole heart. It's sort of pulling on the whole heart. It's mostly pulling on the crotch strap, so you can't go too fast. But um, it pulls on the harness. So that way you don't have to have any arm strength almost no arm strength in terms of hanging on to the scooter. Your arm, your hand can just sit on it, just like you do a steering wheel in your car. When you go forward in your car, the whole thing's going forward. You don't have to hang on to the steering wheel because the car will leave you behind. And that's the same way with the scooters. Once they're clipped up to your crotch D-ring, basically it's just put your hand on the handle, pull the trigger, and then just lean it one side or the other, however, you, whichever way you want to turn. Thanks. I didn't realize for some reason or other when you mentioned BC, I air came to my mind, and I'm going, what? Why does it need air? And won't you be running out of air? <laughs> no, no, sorry. <laughs> that's that's the vest we use for buoyancy control. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. <laughs> so we currently don't have any other questions. I I have one for you, and that um, 
you know, in a lot of the tropical places where you see gobies, you see them where they bury in the sand, you see them with a shrimp. Uh, and yes. it, do our gobies here have any shrimp associates that you know of? I, I've never seen that. I would love to see that somewhere. It'd be, that'd be amazing, but I have not, I have not seen it. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, any other questions out there from our audience? I so say you can unmute yourself and ask a question or put it into the chat if you'd prefer to type it in. Just a, one thought in looking at my notes. Um, the image, and you have some beautiful, oh, I had two actually, but the image that you had uh, with all of, what was it, four or five tanks? Um, oh, yes. Looks very awkward. I mean, I know once you're underwater, it doesn't really, um, the, the weight is, uh, is not really an issue, but is it not cumbersome with all of those and you're trying to move and, and take photographs at the same time? It just, I guess you get used to it, but I don't think I've seen anybody with that many tanks on before. Yeah, it's um, what we do in technical diving. What happens is you'll start with a set of doubles on your back and then they'll add one small deco bottle on the side, on your, on your, on your side. And then, and then gradually, as you get more training, um, doing deeper dives, you'll start adding more bottles. So one of the things that, ha that, that we always talk about in tech diving in terms of managing our gear with all those tanks that you're talking about, it's muscle memory. So wow. we spend hours in 30 feet of water in the bay, usually at White Cliff or maybe Porto or someplace. And we spend... Um, an hour or maybe even two, just unclipping the bottles, handing them to a, one of our dive buddies. They hand it back and then you clip it back on and then you unclip it and give it to somebody else. They give their unclip their bottle. They give it to you. So we, we do, it's called, it's called bottle skills. And, and, and what we do is we get to the point where you can clip up a bottle without having to look. You can just feel your way to the D-ring and you clip it up and you feel your way to your chest D-ring and you clip it up and you just and you just know it's in the right place. It takes a while to get that muscle memory to do that. So though that picture that I showed, that's a very accomplished, very advanced te deep technical diver. So he's been doing clipping those bottles up for probably a few years before doing any of that kind of stuff. So it's not something you can just sort of add a bunch of bottles and then go for a dive because, yeah, it would be cumbersome. And I and I can tell you, even with all the practice and, and the training that we do, um, yes, it's very cumbersome, actually, <laughs> especially if it's uh, especially if you're shore diving, actually, even on, on a boat, because you can attach all those things and then stand up, walk to the back of the boat and then drop into the ocean. Usually what ends up happening is you get in and then someone has to hand you those bottles and then you clip them up in the water. A little harder when you're shore diving. But... Mm. Wow, amazing. Well, thanks. Yeah. Uh, one more question here in the chat for you. Um, Mary is wondering, how often are you out there diving? Almost every weekend. Almost. Um, took a little break over the winter and stuff. Um, I had stretched a tendon in my foot, so I needed to fix that before walking with dive gear on. But uh, outside of things like that, um, we're out there almost every weekend. Well, well you, I have to say your your photos are incredible, absolutely incredible. And, you know, diving in cold water and getting that quality of photos in that cold and in the depth is absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. I think that uh, everybody online tonight will agree that it was uh, absolutely amazing to see the diversity, the color, uh, and and just the stories of the things that are down there. Yeah. So thank again, you, okay. so, Thanks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Lee, for, uh, for doing that. And um, yeah, and uh, like I say, lots of good comments. Thanks for joining us.